Uh, let me introduce my dad, Pastor J.J. Rosen, to the stage. Come on, give it up for J.J. All right, all right. Hey, good job, son. You know what's fun about doing... Yeah, thanks. Ministry with family is that um, there's all kinds of like behind the scenes um, uh, inside jokes that happen around our house because we all do ministry together uh, that you guys would not understand. And so I just sit on the front row and I get to smile and laugh knowing that I've got the inside scoop that you guys don't have. <laughs> so that's the deal. Well, hey, welcome to church this morning. Hey, I'm just going to heat hit the announcements. I'm going to jump right into the message this morning. But before I do that, can we give it up for the dad's in the house, Father's Day. Man, it's a big deal. And even if the dads aren't in the house, guess who God is? God's our heavenly father, right? Hey. Come on, we'll honor God today as well. Um, and, and I think one of the things that's awesome about having so many dads in the house today for us is that, hey, I don't know if you know this or not, but Father's Day is the, t is the lowest attended Sunday church, uh, church service of the year, wow. statistically, not just for us, like that's in America. That's crazy, isn't it? I think it's crazy. I mean, everybody else is like, no, that's totally normal. Like a dad wants to sleep in and grill and do things that's probably not church related. Um, but the reason for that is, I think it's, it's two things. One, it's because Father's Day as a holiday was an afterthought, and it truly was. Uh, you know, as a society, we'd been celebrating Mother's Day for a long time. And there was a woman in Washington State who approached her church and said, hey, can we celebrate our husbands too? And, uh, and, and they were like, well, what day are you thinking? thinking and they and she thought her her late husband his 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 birthday was on June 5th and uh, he was in the war and so to celebrate they she was trying to get it on June 5th and they said well it's a little too late to do that because everything was an afterthought with this Father's Day thing but they're like well how about the third Sunday in July we'll do it that day and they're like oh okay and which is why like you've been getting ads for gifts on your phone all week that say last minute gifts for dad right yeah because it's it's just totally an afterthought so that's one thought. The second thought is, is because typically when guys come to church on Father's Day, they get all beat up because pastors like, Ooh, if they're in the house, I'm going to give it to them today. You know, it's like this one Sunday a year, you know, uh, but here's the deal. I want you to be encouraged today. All right, everybody. Okay. Three people want to be encouraged. Everybody else. I'm going to preach hellfire and brimstone. You're all going to hell this morning. Okay. <laughs> Just kidding. Just kidding. All right. Um, hey, we, we are going to continue our series, though. We're talking about the culture of the kingdom of God, and we're going to talk about what it looks like to be a father in God's kingdom, to be a kingdom father this morning. And um, uh, we're going to look at a story that's a little obscure in Scripture. It's in Second, Chron Second Chronicles chapters 23 and 24. And what's interesting about this story is that I used to read throughout Scripture looking for a godly family, a good example of a good family in the Old Testament, and I couldn't find any. I mean, you started at Adam and Eve, and they're the ones that brought sin into the world, and their kids were crazy. One of their sons killed their other son. I mean, you want to talk about dysfunctional family. That's the first family that ever showed up on the planet, right? So you think your family's bad. Trust me. It's, it's their fault, okay? It just kind of trickled down to the rest of us. You know what I'm saying? That's why there's no perfect families and we're all a little bit dysfunctional. But as you go through scripture, I mean, it's just crazy family after crazy family. I mean, Noah's family, they ended up being crazy. They, you know, Noah ended up with a drinking problem after the flood, which I can understand being stuck in a boat with a bunch of animals in your family for as long as he was. You know, he, he, he came out and ends up getting so drunk that his family has to cover him up naked because he's just, you know, he's passed out naked. And, you know, you go down to David and King David. I mean, he cheated on his wife and he ends up having, having a couple of boys that start a civil war within the nation. I mean, that's dysfunction right there, you know? So I'm reading through scripture. I'm like, where are the examples of good, you know, not just like courageous men of God, but like family men that were courageous men of God. And I just couldn't find him. And I actually, this is a true story, you can believe me or not, but I woke up one morning a few years ago, and I woke up kind of praying in my sleep, and I, and I kept saying this word over and over again that was Jehoiada, Jehoiada, Jehoiada. And I was like, what in the world is this word? And so I go and I Google search the word the best way I know how to spell it. And, uh, and I've done a little bit of Hebrew in my, in my educational uh, career. Um, and so I, I got the spelling close to 
to write, and it popped up. It's a story of a man from 2 Chronicles chapter 23. Have you ever heard of a guy by the name of Jehoiada? I hadn't, so I'm assuming you haven't either, okay? <laughs> and this guy was awesome. His family was awesome. He came from a spiritual lineage of like awesome men and down his family tree, it turned into awesome men. Like, there's this amazing spiritual legacy that surrounds this guy and his family was amazing. As a matter of fact, his wife was powerful and outspoken and spicy. As a matter of fact, she risked her... I got one A from him from one lady. I mean, come on, ladies. Where's the other strong, godly, spicy women in the house? Come on. I know it's Father's Day, but, you know, God loves you too. All right? Uh, your day was a few weeks ago, okay? Don't give me any of that business. We're going to give this day to the dads, all right? But listen, his wife, her name was Jehoshiba, and she risked her life and the life of her family to support her entire kingdom when she saved a child from, from the hands of, you know, of an evil uh, uh, female leader. And when she did, her husband, Jehoiada, came to support her in what was happening. And what ends up ensuing in the story is awesome. We'll get into it. I'm not going to tell you the whole story because I'm still in the intro of my message. All right. Uh, but there's a couple things that I want to address because I think that if a Bible story is not applicable to the day and age in which we're living, it doesn't matter. Right. It's like uh, I, whenever I create a message, I always ask the question, what is going to pass the who cares on Monday test? You know what I'm saying? Like when you show up tomorrow to work or you wake up for your family or whatever, uh, um, does anything you, you heard and learned at church on Sunday, does it matter? All right? Uh, so it has to pass the who cares test. So this is what I want to do, dads, <clears throat> because I'm going to speak a little bit more directly to you. I think everybody else, you're going to absolutely get something out of this message. Um, but I don't want you to feel beat up this morning. I, what I want you to do is I want you to see through the lens this morning of being encouraged and how great your influence actually is. But I want to start by stating a problem. And the problem is, I think it's become very obvious to a lot of people, and it's that we live in a society today that is more and more devaluing the role of masculinity and manhood. Can I get a better amen there, somebody? Yeah. Because at the very least, whether you agree with that or not, it's certainly not an exaggeration to say that manhood and fatherhood seems to be under attack in our society. And I think the culture of the world is certainly trying to redefine the role of men in Western society. And if you turn on TV today, I mean, it's, it's wild because any, any man or, or, or father within a sitcom, a movie, or even in cartoons that are geared towards our children, fathers are depicted as kind of like these overweight, lazy, beer-gutted, silly fools. It's crazy to me. By the way, single ladies, this is why when you're looking to date someone, you want to date somebody that's actually a man because otherwise you're gonna, your whole life will be playing into the hand of society and culture as we know it. But manhood and masculinity is just more important than we could possibly imagine. You know, it's our desire, it's our objective around here is to build a church that champions fathers that champions strong families. We actually say that our purpose as a church is to build strong families that then build strong communities because we believe strong families build strong communities and strong local churches build strong families. We, we believe that wholeheartedly with everything that's inside of us. And it's not that we're against anything else that's happening in culture. It's just this is what we will be for. This is, these are the things that we're going to champion in our life. And this is our objective to build a church that does that. And I think Think the question comes back often. It's like, why? Like, like, why? Why are we? Why? Why do we constantly? Haven't haven't men be lifted enough? Why are we not lifting lifting women more under kind of this guise in the name of equity? Uh, but the issue is with with equity. Equity exists to devalue one to lift up the other. Okay, And I just don't believe that it has to be either or. I think we can do both and. And I think God is a both and kind of God. 
I think God's a both and kind of a God, not just with men and women. I think he's a both and kind of a God with all things because he is great and above him there is no other. Like that's who God is, right? And so if that's the case, then we don't have to demonize one to lift up the other. But if that's the direction that society's going, hey, let's do a checkup real quick and let's see how it's working, okay, everybody? So this is what I did. I pulled a few statistics for us today. So bear with me as I share a few of these with you, because I'm going to share several. And let me just warn you ahead of time, they're going to be a little bit shocking at times. Uh, but let me share with you some statistics about fatherless homes or um, uh, fathers that are just uh, uh, rem removed from their family. Here it is. The first one is this. Is that 63% of all youth suicides come from children in fatherless homes. 90% of all runaway children are from fatherless homes. 85% of all people with behavioral disorders come from fatherless homes. 71% of high school dropouts come from fatherless homes. 75% of adolescent chemical abuse patients in treatment centers currently are from fatherless homes. 85% of youths in prison are from fatherless homes. 85% of homeless families have a fatherless home, girls without a father in the home are eight times more likely to experience a teen pregnancy. Here's one that hits home, especially lately. 96% of all school shootings are committed by somebody from a fatherless home, and 90% of all violence that is being enacted in our schools are committed by people from fatherless homes. Now, where do I get those statistics? Because, you know, 92% of statistics are all made up on the spot. Okay, so let me give you my sources real quick because I think it's important. My data sources come from the U.S. Census Bureau, Langman, the Department of Justice, and the Minnesota Psychiatric Society. There you go. I just, I submit that to you. This is where I got all of this data. And now these are obviously sh some shocking stats, but they're not overly surprising, are they? I mean, if we were to be really honest, I mean, they might be shocking, but they're not surprising to us. And it may not be politically correct to say this, but it's true that a father's influence is astronomically greater than the minimized and mocked role that has been given to them in Western society. And I said it on YouTube. Listen, this is not a message to minimize the role of moms in the house, okay? I think the mother's role is equally as important to the father's role. As a matter of fact, I believe that the two roles, are, that God created them so that they complete each other, that they complement e e each other. But the fact of the matter is, is that as a child matures, they're going to increasingly look to a father or a male role model to help them process their decisions and to adopt their worldview and their values as they move forward. As of 2022, one in four children live in a fatherless home, which means for those of us that are godly men, we have a great opportunity in front of us. As a matter of fact, the influence that you have, and you probably don't have to do anything more than you're currently doing, is so important, and that it's so great that when you leave here after church today on Sunday, you should leave with your head held high and your shoulders back, knowing that people that are around you will be blessed because you are here. It's why it's so important that a man must not be absent, indifferent, or inadequate as a father for his kids, or they will struggle to mature in life. And the stakes could not be higher today. We could not understate the importance of the stakes that are at hand there was a, another study that was done in Switzerland in conjunction with several of the mainline denominations, and it says that if a father doesn't attend church, even if the mother does, only one child in 50 will have a genuine relationship with Jesus. Now, single mom, if you're in the house today, let me tell you something right now. God loves 
doing exceptional things. And so I would just say, as a product of a single mother home, be the exception to the rule. Believe God to be the exception of the rule because God loves to do exceptional things. But if the father attends church and the mother doesn't, 66% of those children will have a genuine, authentic relationship with Jesus. One in 50 if mom does, 66% if dad does, and over 80% if the family unit as a whole attends church together will have a genuine relationship with Jesus. Man, that's amazing. I mean, think about the influence of a godly man. Think about the influence of a man who has a deep, personal, genuine relationship with God and doesn't hide it in his life, doesn't place it in his personal life, but lives it out loud for all to see. It's a game changer. And we're not talking about being perfect, everybody, because that's not who we are. We're not perfect people. No, no, no. God takes our imperfection and does something amazing with it, because that's who he is. He said, Jesus in the world, not to condemn the world, but that through him we might have life and be saved. From what? Because we're imperfect. Your influence is great. And I think we need a generation of men that understand the importance of being an influential, godly father. And we're going to call those a father that's in the kingdom. And the fact is this, is that you can biologically produce a family, but that doesn't make you a father. You can be married, but it doesn't make you a lover. You can be male, (laughs) but it doesn't make you a man. See, the way that we live and lead at home and in public will influence our children and everything around us and ultimately the generation to come if we will lead well down the chain of our family tree. All right, did I set that up well enough for everybody? Okay, Jehoiada. This is my guy, all right? This is like my favorite character in all of Scripture. The Bible tells us that he was the chief priest and he was also a military commander. As far as we know, he is the only priest in the entire history of Israel to be buried with the kings. Awesome. Awesome man. He loved, he listened... To his wife, even in the face of trouble, he had mentors. His his grandfather was awesome. Up his chain of chain up, up the chain of his family tree was awesome. Down below his family tree, it was filled with warriors, heroes, intellectuals, and priests unto God. He was a man that was celebrated in Scripture, and yet nobody has heard of him. It's weird. Almost as if society has its own agenda. It's shocking. Let me set up the story for you. After the death of Solomon, the kingdom of Israel was split into two different parts. So, you know, if you've ever read the Old Testament and, you've, and it was confusing when, when the Old Testament talked about Judah and it talked about Israel, but somehow they were together and Jerusalem was in Judah, but not in Israel. I don't understand all that stuff. Well, let me just clear that up for you real quick. What happened after Solomon's death is that the kingdom was split into two, a northern and a southern kingdom. It was Israel and Judah, okay? Uh, and those were the two kingdoms that were there. They ended up having their own kings as well during that during that time and and the kings of Israel in general they became worshipers of Baal they were kind of they became evil kings and the the kings of Judah were typically still pretty godly until a king came along named Jehoshaphat and he ends up uh, uh, partnering with the evil king of Israel for this battle and what ends up happening is the paganism that was in Israel starts to lean starts to kind of leak into leach into the kingdom of Judah and then the king started to kind of go off track and so Jehoshaphat he dies and his son Jehoram became king Jerusalem was attacked and everything of value in is in uh, in Israel excuse me in Jerusalem was taken including the king and his family they were 
all taken as well during this time with, under, under Jehoram's rule. And when and all of this, uh, all, all this happened except for Jehoram's young son, Ahaziah. And so Ahaziah, he ends up being this king. A lot of names, okay? Stick with me, everybody. Ahaziah is 22 years old when he becomes king, and he only ends up ruling for one year. Nobody trusted him. He was in and out. He was kind of an evil king for a year. He ends up getting assassinated uh, because nobody trusted him. And his mother, her name was Athaliah, Okay. Okay, now we're, now we're getting into the story right here. Thank you for bearing with me. Athaliah was Jezebel's daughter. Jezebel, was, Jezebel and King Ahab married together were probably the most evil ruling family in all of Israel. And Athaliah was, was evil as well. She ends up ruling in Israel for six years because Ahaziah had a son. And his name was Joash. And he was just an infant. He was a baby. Well, Athaliah, Athaliah, she wanted to rule so badly that she started to go throughout the kingdom and she started assassinating all of the roy all of like the next in line royalty to be king in Judah because she wanted to reign. And Jehoshaphat, Jehoiada's wife, takes the baby and runs into the uh, into the uh, the temple to hide the baby under. Uh, order of death. And so she runs, goes to Jehoiada. Jehoiada rallies the troops to protect the baby and says, listen, the baby is going to be the new king, but he's clearly not ready to rule. So they had to put up with Athaliah for six years as she ruled. Well, time goes on for, for uh, Joash. He grows up. He gets to be about seven years old. Perfect age to become king, you know, seven. And uh, like, did, have you ever had a seven-year-old? Anybody in here had a seven-year-old? King? I mean, I know we live in Western culture. It seems like every seven-year-old's a king in their, their house right now, but come on. It's okay to laugh in church, okay? All right? Um, so he's seven years old, and, and Jehoiada, he rallies all the people of influence in the kingdom, and they get Joash, and they set him on the throne. They crown him, and they make him king of Israel. Okay, so this is kind of where we pick up this story. I want to give you a good enough background so that when I'm talking about it, you're not confused. You kind of know where we're where we're going here. Okay, so you got this 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 little boy Joash. He's becoming king. So in the seventh year of Athaliah's reign, Athaliah's reign. Excuse me. Jehoiada the priest decided to act, and so he summoned. You know, and can I just pause right there and say say this? Uh, Sooner or later, it's going to cause, like, sooner or later, you're going to come to a point, a fork in the road, a, a decision that has to be made for your life, men, that you're going to have to act. Can I just let that sit on you for a minute? Goes on to say, he decides to act. And so he summoned the courage and made a pact with the five different commanders, a bunch of these names and more names that are here. Verse 2, these men traveled secretly throughout Judah, and they summoned the Levites and the clan leaders in all the towns to come to Jerusalem, and they all gathered in the temple of God where they made a solemn pact with Joash, the young king. Jehoiada said to them, here is the king's son. The time has come for him to reign. The Lord has promised that a descendant of David will be our king. This is interesting because Joash being a descendant of king means that he was all that, that Jesus is actually a descendant of King Joash on his mother's side. So, you know, it's just you know, a little sidebar there for you. An interesting piece of information. Um, and this way he says in verse four, this is what you must do. When you priests and Levites come on duty on the Sabbath on the third day, you will serve as gatekeepers. And then I'm going to skip through part of the story because all he does, is he tells everybody, here's the stations you need to take to protect the king, the new, the new young king from Athaliah and, the, uh, and, and her evil forces, okay? So from the dark side, hang in there with me. Verse 8, so the Levites and all the people... Of Judah, they did everything as Jehoiada the priest ordered. Verse 9, then Jehoiada supplied the commanders with all kinds of weapons and all of these things. Skip down to verse 11. It says, then Jehoiada and his sons. Then Jehoiada and his sons, they brought out the seven-year-old. 
Joash, the king's son, they placed a crown on his head and presented him with a copy of God's word. They anointed him and proclaimed him king, and everyone shouted, Long live the king. Well, Athaliah heard all the noise that was happening in the city. He saw, saw, she saw people running around. They heard people celebrating the new king. And so she goes to run to find what happens, sees what's happening, realizes that she has lost her rule. She tears her clothes. She screams upsetly and says, treason! To which Jehoiada ordered them to take her out back, and they got rid of her really fast. That's the JJ version. That's the, that's the JJPG version of, of what happened to Athaliah, okay? But let me skip down here and, and read this in verses 16 and 17. It says, then Jehoiada made a covenant. Be- Isn't this a great story? Like, don't you, had, have you ever read just like a story of adventure and chivalry like, you, like, like, like this in the Bible? I mean, this is awesome. This is why you got to read your Bible, okay, everybody? All right. Then Jehoiada made a covenant between him and the king and the people that they would be the Lord's people. And all the people went over to the temple of Baal. They tore it down. They demolished all the altars. They smashed the idols. And they got rid of Matan, the priest of Baal, in front of the altars. And then in verses, uh, chapter 24, verses 1 and 2, it says, Joash, this is the really important part. Read this with me, everybody. It says, Joash was seven years old when he became king. And he reigned in Jerusalem 40 years. His mother was Zabiah from Beersheba, verse 2. This is, this is, I love this. Verse 2, go to verse 2. Joash did what was pleasing in the Lord's sight throughout the lifetime of Joash? No. Throughout the lifetime of Jehoiada, the priest. Okay. Pause. Because we got a huge contrast here happening in his father's life, Ahaziah's life who ruled for one year, he was wicked, he ends up being assassinated because nobody trusted him. And Joash, who ruled for 40 years and turned the entire kingdom around back to God, what was the difference? One of them was influenced by Ahab's family, a bunch of ev- an evil man with a bunch of evil people. The other one was influenced by Jehoiada's family, a-, a godly, powerful man in his family. What am I trying to say, everybody, is that fathers in the kingdom, they influence everything that's around them. And you influence way more than you know that you do. Okay. I'm going to share with you just three things that I see in the life of Jehoiada about becoming a godly father in the kingdom. But let me give you two warnings and a tip first. And the first warning is this, is that love does not equal influence. You can love your kids more than anything and have zero influence over them. Warning number two. Position does not equal influence. Just because you've married a woman and you've had kids, it does not automatically mean that you're a father of influence. You might be able to create fear and change behavior in your kids' lives. But that doesn't mean you're having any godly influence into their life. All right? Those are the two warnings. Here's here's the tip. And you have to have this in mind when we go into the rest of this. Because if not, what you'll do is I'll get you all fired up to go and be a godly man. And then you'll, like, lord it over your family and your kids. And your wife will be like, oh, my God. All right? And here's the tip, and it's this. Relationship is everything. Because if you have a great relationship with your kids... If you have a great relationship with young men that are around you that need their influence in their life, their heart will open up, they will hear you, and it will change their lives. You may not have kids, but you know what? You might have some young men, some young women that are around you that if you'll just build a relationship with them, the influence on your life, it'll just bleed into their life, and you'll have a greater impact than you could ever imagine because you just have an authentic, real, genuine relationship with them. All right, three keys to becoming a godly father. Number one, a godly father 
has a spiritual legacy. This is Jehoiada's life right here. He was the grandson. And so I have to do a little bit of a retraction from a message I did about a year ago, okay, about Jehoiada. Um, the, the, the history of his family lineage is not super clear. And there's a bunch of guys, there's like three guys by the name of Jehoiada, and there's two guys by the name of Benaiah. All right? I said Jehoiada was Benaiah's father, which is true. I just called it the wrong Benaiah. The timeline is, the timeline is a little bit different there. Okay? Okay, so, however... Benaiah, who was one of David, King David's mighty men, was actually our Jehoiada. It was his grandfather. Okay? And so now you look up his family tree, and not only did we have godly, powerful men, but like this dude, Benaiah, was bad. Like in the Bible, the stories about him are like he faced down a lion in a cave on a snowy day. Like instantly gives you a picture of how bad this dude was, right? Uh, not only that, but he, he led an elite group of soldiers for King David to the tune of about 40,000 men. Just awesome. This is just Jehoiada's grandfather. And there's a spiritual legacy that was just dripped down down all the way through his family tree. And, and, and the thing that you, we see in Jehoiada's life, not just into his kids, but up his family tree, is this idea of blessing that just comes because they feared the Lord. It, it's pretty awesome. And I think the, the promise comes from Proverbs chapter 22 and verse 4, where it says, true humility and fear of the Lord lead to riches, honor, and long life. In other words, listen, man, I want my grandchildren's children to continue to, to, continue to live in the kingdom and influence and not struggle with their maturity and not struggle with their spirituality and not struggle in their lives. And so what that means, everybody, is that as I pray, as I read my Bible, I'm not just getting smarter. I'm actually investing into my children's children and children. You mean there's more of a purpose for my time with God than me just getting smarter or more spiritually strong? Yes. Because what you do in your life will trickle down into and through the rest of your family as you pray, as you read your Bible, as you have a genuine relationship with God, you're actually investing into your kids' kids all the way down the line. But we have to come to the realization that it starts with us so that God can cause it to trickle down. You may come from a family that doesn't have a great legacy. That would be a little bit of my story. But you know what? God caused me to be the change agent in my family tree. And you might be here today, and you're the change agent in your family tree, where there were curses that came down through your family, like alcohol addiction and, and abuse and, 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 and apathy that came down through your family tree. But because of what God has done in your life, it stops here today. And what God goes down through your tree changes everything because a godly father leaves a spiritual legacy. You know, there's a guy by the name of Jonathan Edwards. He was a, a, a revivalist. He was a preacher back during the colonial days and the start of our nation. And he's the one who preached this famous sermon called Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. And what it did is it shocked New England. A revival spread throughout the colonies because of this guy's sermon that he was preaching. And what historians have done is they've gone through and they've looked at the descendants of Jonathan Edwards and they've been able to trace well over 400 of them to see what they've all gone on to do. You want to talk about spiritual legacy? Watch this, everybody. 14 of them became college presidents, 100 college professors, 100 ministers of the gospels, missionaries, uh, and theological teachers, 100 judges and attorneys, 60 doctors, and many more went on to be authors and editors of high rank. Now that is a spiritual legacy, and he didn't even have to do anything but focus on his relationship with God and watch it just Number two, a godly father loves God passionately. And Jehoiada's love and honor for God, it overflowed into how the nation would be run. And I think our kids need fathers that are totally and completely sold out for Jesus. Dads that lead from within and by example. Fathers that aren't asking kids to do what they did once upon a time, but that are doing right now and are passionate about today. 
Number three, a father is spiritually intentional. A father is spiritually intentional. What does that mean? Let me tell you five ways to be intentional. Here you go. Ready? Number one, do it with conviction. Because if it's not on your heart, it won't be on them. Be passionate about your kids so it drives you to be a protector, a presider, and a provider over your family. you got to have some conviction in your life. There's enough milk toast. There's enough normal. That's, what is normal anyway? What does that even mean? That doesn't mean anything in our society. Live your life with a little moxie. So another word I wanted to say that is not appropriate for a mixed company. Use your imagination. Okay, just kidding. Have some conviction and some moxie and some passion about your life. Number two, do it with consistency. Listen, praise God for church, but church should be supplemental to what you're already doing at home. Every day, speak life over your kids and over your kids' friends and over the young people that are around you. You know, our kids, I would I'd bring them to school and I'd drop them off and I would say, what would I say? I'd say, go and... Uh, yeah. Thank you. My youngest son got it. My oldest son is struggling right now. Yeah. <laughs> We'll give it to the we'll give it to the 13 year old. Be a leader, not a follower today in Jesus' name. And we spoke that over him, which you can tell who the leader is amongst our boys, apparently. It's, it's really sad. It's really sad. Number number three, do it conversationally. Steer your conversations towards biblical values, especially during times when they need the advice. And you know what? You know what's fun? If you don't know the answer, go look it up together. Listen, I've done that with my kids. They ask me a question, I'm like, I know I'm supposed to know everything, but I don't know that one. Let's go find out. Genuine, authentic, conversationally. At the end of the day, you're going to have to talk and say something to your kids, so it might as well be good. Invest that time into them. Don't just spend your time with them. Number four, do it during times of non-confrontation. Listen, I had a friend of mine, God bless him, but whenever his kids would do something dumb, he'd like send them to their room to go read their Bible. How on fire are those kids for Jesus today? Right? What if you actually spoke life into your kids during times when there was no confrontation? And depending upon how old your kids are, you might have to, like, design those times. You know what I mean? But do not. Listen, if you're a child, if you're, like, we're all kids, but if you're a young adult in the house, like, you know, there's a bunch of you that are out here today, how about you try to create some times of non-confrontational with, non-confrontational with your dads and just see what happens? could change your life forever. Don't violate the times of non-confrontation. The influence. There's high stakes. There's high stakes. And lastly, do it confidently. <laughs> no shame. Be loud. Be conspicuous. You know, there's a time when I found out I wasn't being conspicuous enough. And what happened was, is I was, I asked one of my boys, it was my middle son. He's, he'd be the most likely one to give it back to me anyway. I love you, Grant. I'm sure he's watching online at some point in time. At least I hope he is. <laughs> but I asked him if he's been reading his Bible. Hey, go read your Bible. Have you been reading your Bible? And he was like, well, you don't read your Bible. I'm a pastor. And what I realized was, I mean, I read my Bible every day, but I was reading on my app on my phone. So to my kids, all they saw me doing was just spending time on my phone. Like they didn't know. So I just wasn't being conspicuous. So I ended up getting a couple of more like paper Bibles around the house. And some of them I don't use and some of them I do. And we just leave them laying around the house. But they see me open up the pages and see it because I'm conspicuous, I'm out loud. There's a confidence to the, to the influence I'm trying to have in the lives of my kids. Dads, let them see you read God's word. Let them see you pray. Let them see you lift your hands and worship to music that's in your house. You have no idea what that influence will do to their lives because I just believe that we must live in a way that is informed by what we believe 
Everything about the world is just like, shh, hey, you little Christian over there, shush. shush. Oh, Christian man, oh, that's just, that's just like a white man's perspective. That's just a man's perspective. That, oh, you're just, that's traditional. That doesn't mean anything for today. And it's just like, it downplays everything in our culture. But I think that we need to push against that and live in a way that is informed by what we believe. That we would be bold enough to speak truth when people don't want to hear it and live for God when people don't want us to. This is a father that leaves a legacy, a spiritual passion who is intentional with his kids. This is a man who isn't traveling the easy road. He's traveling a road that is less traveled in our society. It's fraught with criticism and it's challenging, but this man is blessed according to Proverbs 22. And you know what happens to everyone around him? (laughs) Everyone around him starts to get blessed. Because God wants to do in and through you more than you could ever do on your own. And therefore, if you'll just go before God, he'll do the rest through you. But we're not going to be ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen. Come on, let's pray. God, we love you. We thank you for your word. God, I thank you for the life of Jehoiada. And I know I'm going to get to heaven and meet him. And and he's going to tell me I've been pronouncing his name wrong all these years. But that's all right. I thank you for the example of this man's life. And God, I ask that you would make every man in here an example to those that are around them, not as perfect individuals, but passionate believers of Jesus who are honest about their down, their failures and their faults and know that God loves them anyway. God, would you bring children back to their fathers and turn the hearts of the fathers back to their children today? Our society needs it so bad. We come against a spirit of strife that is that is rampant in our society. And we break its power over this community. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, everybody. Come on, would you stand with me? missed a great opportunity to put your hands together, by the way. It's okay. It's okay. Thank you. He's trying to make up for him earlier. It's all right. I love you, son. I'm just playing. All right. I hope you guys go grill, go hang out, call your dad if he's not with you, go hang out with some friends, smile big, be a great example for what God's doing in your life today, everybody. And remember, if you, if you ended up filling out a connection card or you want to give, the offering box is just in the back on the right on the way out of there, on the way out of here, there. Um, and if you are here for the first time, just know it's not our heart uh, uh, for, for you to like to put a bunch of pressure on you to give or anything like that. Let, let this service be our gift to you today. Um, that's for everybody else that calls themselves bravers here at Brave Church. And so I just made that up. I, I kind of like that. I don't know. I just made it up. But let me bless you before you go, okay? May the Lord bless you and keep you. May his face shine upon you and grant you peace all the days of your life. May you go out of here bold and passionate for Jesus. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be dismissed. Thank you.